Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First United Church of Christ on what appears to be a glorious Sunday morning. We have a number of announcements to make. Uh, number one, you'll note that the rubber sale and planning is beginning, and uh, we will be accepting donations following Labor Day. The, the dates for setup and so on are in the bulletin. And uh, I know that Linda, you know what mention of the picnic coming up? Good morning, everyone. September 15th, we're going to have a church picnic, hopefully out in the courtyard. Uh, nobody is invited, uh, and uh, we hope everyone will come with a covered dish. We'd love to see you, and if, if it does rain or shower, we'll be in the banquet hall. Hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. We had a great time the last time we did this, so we're looking forward to it. A uh, number of announcements to share with you. Uh, Margaret from the office says, hallelujah, there's a new baby girl, Parker Lynn, that's uh, Marge's great, great niece. As always, she wants us to uh, remember the young kids going back to school, not just young kids, but college kids as well. Last Sunday afternoon, we had the opportunity to host about 80 Lafayette College students in, in our church parlor. They came, they prepared dinner, they left the place pick and span. The kids are terrific. And that's an opportunity for uh, about 40 or 50 freshmen who come in every year and volunteer to work in a number of local agencies, both with senior citizens and with kids. The kids are orientation to the fact that Lafayette students should be engaged in the community, and it's really a, a neat time. And uh, they have uh, juniors and seniors who have been involved in the program come back and be their, their mentors. Uh, two young ladies said goodbye as they were leaving here and said it's very sentimental. We just sit here for a while. We've been here for four years and they just want to sit and and absorb the church, so I think they're really kind of neat. And uh, whether or not they attend church, I think we at least had some impact upon them, and that's part of our, our mission in town. Other than that, uh, we want to keep uh, the Cook family in our prayers. Uh, Jackie Wilcox's uh, husband passed away, and uh, we keep Mark and Tara and uh, the entire family in our prayers. Uh, Bishop Bernie, who experienced the death of her mother at 102 years old, and we have uh, Three folks asking for prayers for healing. Uh, Joy, Joy Love, Bill Cuffey, and, and Mary Dinnerline, Dinnerline. And we also pray for baby Stevie. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yes, uh, I don't see him here, but I know that he appreciated if you come out. Uh, Eastern Municipal Band wraps up the Muser Concert Series tonight at 6 o'clock Muser Park. Wrapping up in the concert series, the beginning football season tells us that uh, we're about to embark upon a change of seasons. And so it's a, tomorrow's reminder that the Eastern Municipal Band has really become a, a great organization. If there are no other announcements, please stand for our call to worship. People of God, listen. Wisdom calls and understanding raises their voice. We gather to grow in wisdom and understanding to hear God's word for us. She stands at roadside and cries to her people to take instruction. Let us pay attention and let us worship God. Let's begin our, our, our worship this morning by singing together by hymn number 459, Come All Fount of Every Blessing.
still speaking God. And like the people of Jerusalem long ago, we would often misunderstand the Spirit's movement among us. In silence and still as at this moment, let us near to God and listen. Let us confess our sins together. We have failed as your church, O oh God. You call us to live faithfully, act justly, and bring peace to the earth. Instead, our lives and your church reflect more of our needs and worries and less of the needs and worries of all peoples. Move us beyond ourselves to hear the cry of the world and respond with acts and deeds of kindness, mercy, and justice. May your grace shine through a church that even with its shortcomings accept the call of Christ to serve and care and love and bring peace. May we feel your forgiving spirit now. Amen. It's a great joy that we know that in the name of Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And in our forgiveness may we blossom fully with purpose and resolve so that the world will truly know us by our love. Lord, my God, 
Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day. This place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer of your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when they come and pray toward this temple. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all of the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people, Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And our gospel reading is from John chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as a living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many disciples desert Jesus. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. These are the words of God. Thanks be to God.
So how many of you remember singing Jesus Loves Me? Mm -hmm. Really kind of interesting. There was a story uh, that came out of the Union Theological Seminary now quite a few years ago. Paul Tillich, the author of what many consider to be the, the comprehensive, most comprehensive systematic theology in the Protestant Church, uh, was speaking to a group of students. And of course, there are always students who think they're smarter than the presenter. And uh, one young smart Alex said, uh, Dr. Tell, Dr. Tell, I've got a really important question to ask you. He said, sir, what's your question? He goes, How, you've got this three-volume set of systematic theology that goes on for 1,500 pages. Now, could you simply put it in a simple way that other people could understand? So I looked at him and winked his eye and said, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. But it would be kind of interesting if you can capsule in many respects the... Uh, the integrity and the purpose of the gospel in a remarkably simple song we learned as, as kids. It's football season. You know, a football game on one TV last night. We watched the Eagles in a couple of preseason games. And there's an old story about, about football I thought I'd share with this morning. A story about a, a game between two teams. One was physically dominant, much, much bigger than the other. They dominated the other team physically. They dominated them intellectually and emotionally, they were, they were intimidated. But the small team, the small team had one player they really thought could be their, their secret to success. Uh, he was the fastest player in the entire league. His name was Calhoun. And the, the coach felt that he could get Calhoun, Calhoun could get any blocking whatsoever. He could get around all those, those big guys and, and score the winning touchdown. So we called the quarterback over to the sideline and they began to engage in that conversation. And the quarterback agreed that the key to the game was to give the the ball to Calhoun. So the first play came and Calhoun didn't, didn't touch the ball. The coach was mystified but he decided he'd let things go on for the next play. The second play, but once again, Calhoun didn't touch the ball. The coach called timeout, dragged the quarterback over the sideline, threw his clipboard on the ground and said, I thought I told you to get the ball to Calhoun. Next play, third down, you give him the ball. Well, third play came and went and Calhoun still didn't get the ball. When we've seen an irate coach who went to the sideline, this guy epitomized that, that, that irateness. He said, I told you, get the ball to Calhoun. And the coach, quarterback agreed, this, this place for sure, coach, I'll get the ball to Calhoun. Well, fourth down came. Calhoun doesn't get the ball. Quarterback gets sacked, and, and they lose the game. Uh, the coach was really angry, and I said, I told you four times, get the ball to Calhoun. What happened? He said, Coach, you just don't understand. Four times I tried to give Calhoun the ball, and four times Calhoun wouldn't take the ball. Calhoun might have been the fastest guy on the team, but he, uh, he wasn't committed. And I think any of us would say that the, the most vital qualities in any kind of aspect of successful life is, 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 is commitment, being willing to carry the ball no matter how big the, the adversary is. It's true in the marketplace. It, it's true in marriage. It's, it's true in taking care of your health. It, it's, key in being a responsible citizen. Success in any endeavor in which we, we hope to be successful is, is commitment. We can guarantee no commitment and, and no victory. That's true of every, every aspect of life. And I think what we find out from this remarkable scripture lesson from, from John 6 today is, is that commitment is exceedingly important as we make that commitment to, to Jesus Christ. It needs to be a total commitment. And I think the, the unfortunate rule of thumb is that uh, when it comes to making authentic commitments to Jesus Christ, a lot of us find ourselves being like Calhoun. We don't really want to carry that ball. We've been reading John 6 for the past several weeks, and you get the hint that this is one of the most powerful and most important elements of the entire New Testament. And in John 6, we see one of the most dazzling uh, scenes in, in, in entirety. Jesus just, be, just finished feeding the the multitude. And we know the impact upon the multitude was, was absolutely incredible. It was enormous. They, they knew that somebody remarkably special was in their environment, and they wanted to, to make him king. They talked about making him king. And Jesus observed that and saw they were really getting out of hand, and he decided it was time to retreat across the Sea of Galilee, and he went to home to Capernaum. And the people came looking for him there, and Jesus knew that they they come because they were so impressed with the miracles that he'd uh, he performed. So he decided it was time to separate the sheep from the goats, if you will. 
from those who were absolutely committed to those who were only kind of casually interested. And so Jesus began to discuss theology. And I think if you talk to any minister at all, they'll say, if you want to clear a room, start talking about theology. People will flee like the rats leaving a ship. Nobody wants to engage in that, that kind of conversation. And Jesus begins to discuss theology with, with, with the multitude. And what he's really discussing is, is the sacrament of, that we come to know as the Lord's Supper. It wasn't a particularly popular topic for, for conversation. The people who heard it had no idea in the world what he, what he was talking about. And they were repulsed by the imagery of, of that discussion. He seemed to be telling his disciples that they would be eating his body and, and drinking his blood. And the people began to wonder, you know, is that really uh, a new religion or, or, or is that uh, something more pagan? They didn't get it. They were disappointed. And they began to leave. What they wanted him to do was tell them all the good things he was going to do for them. You know, and they're not much different from, from most of us today. We, we want the benefits, but we're not really prepared to, to pay the cost. And Jesus wanted them to know that the easy part of all this was, was over. Now it's time to tackle, tackle the nitty gritty of what a commitment to the kingdom of God really meant. And the crowd told them in no uncertain terms they wanted nothing to do with it. In verse 66, we read these remarkable words. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So those are our key words in the scripture. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, I know a lot of us have been through some difficult times in recent years. We've gone through the health problems and family problems and business problems and financial problems. Life hasn't always been that rosy scenario that we all anticipated it was going to be when we were in our 20s. And sometimes we find ourselves begin to becoming under pressure, beginning to, to weaken. And you know, the good news is that Jesus understands that. After he fed the 5,000, people wanted to, to declare him king. And he knew full well that in a few days that their enthusiasm had cooled that they turned away. This was really the, the turning point in, in, in Jesus' ministry. I think he knew this was always going to happen, but it still had to be remarkably disappointing to him. The fact is that Jesus isn't for everyone. Jesus is for everyone, but not everyone really is for Jesus. And sometimes even when we declare that we are committed to Jesus, it's kind of difficult to, to go all the way. Reverend Dave Galloway tells an interesting story, at least I think a funny story, he's an Episcopalian priest. He was, had just finished playing a round of golf down in, uh, in, in Tyler, Texas, playing with three of his good buddies. They, they stopped in at the Willowbrook uh, Country Club Grill for some refreshments, and the room was absolutely full of people, and they're doing all the things we do. And, you're sitting around having some refreshments after golf. You're bragging about those marvelous drives you had and the incredible putts you made. We lie a lot in golf. Well, pretty soon Hugh comes into the room, and Galway says that Hugh was from, from Central Casting for Texas. He was large and loud. Hugh always wanted to let everyone know that, that he was in the house. And he said, it's not surprising that no one ever wanted to play with you because he was such an obnoxious and overbearing personality. And he said, Galloway was just sitting there when Hugh came in and drinking one hand and a cigar on the other, and he came up to, to Galloway's table and he started talking loudly. It was the only volume I guess he had, and he bellowed at Galloway, you Episcopalians don't really believe in the Bible, do you? Rather than take the bait, Galloway said, I just sat there and uh, smiled at him. I hope you passed like a East Texas thunderstorm. Then he called Galloway by night. He said, David, I want to go to a church that this Bible believing. Do you understand a place where the preacher is not trying to tippy-toe around uh, the hard lessons of Jesus? I want a preacher who will be pulled and, and, and put it out there, the full measure of the Bible, uh, don't hold back on the deck. I want a preacher who won't let the sinner slide, who will call him out by name. I want, a, I want the full gospel. I don't want any preacher pussyfooting around the message of Jesus. Galloway said, I, I have no idea where, I, where, where my response came from. But all of a sudden, I heard myself saying, so, you want the full gospel, right here? You mean that part about selling all that you have and, and giving it to the poor? He said, the room got deathly silent. But you responded, well, I guess, I guess that's not the part I really was most interested in hearing about. 
we know that, that so many of Jesus' disciples sometimes just, just slink away, uh, particularly if we're put on the spot to, to live through some of Jesus' more difficult teachings. Now, Jesus didn't really ask you to give away to sell all you have and give it to the poor, but he simply told us to prepare to do that if the situation required. Jesus told us we had to have compassion for the poor. When we come to those kinds of situations, we really find that, that Jesus isn't for everyone. And sometimes, those of us who are genuinely committed get distracted. One author wrote that, that as a kid, he, he squirmed through a lot of worship services. And I can admit the same thing. I squirmed through a lot of church services. He said, um, there one particular Sunday morning I was forced to deal with a kind of interesting distraction. As soon as the preacher stood up and began to deliver a sermon, a tiny little cricket popped out on the, on the platform. Dark little creature. He probably came out from one of the cracks in the old building. He kind of looked dazed and... Uh, he stumbled near the edge of the pulpit area. He said, I couldn't keep my eyes off that little cricket that moved from one side of the platform to the other. But whenever it would come to the edge of the platform, I found myself mentally saying, jump, jump, don't get stepped on. But he just kept moving back and forth. He said, I don't know what the sermon was, was about that day. I don't know if it was a good sermon or a bad sermon, but the cricket, the cricket sure was fun to watch. He said, you know, this was a Baptist church. And at the close of the service, we had an altar call. And uh, when the invitation song began to, to go, uh, all of a sudden, the pastor almost jumped and stepped on the cricket. And everybody began to laugh because lots of people were watching the cricket. He said, uh, then my laughter turned to amazement. He said, somebody had gone forward to, to receive Christ, and it was my dad. He said, my dad had never made that commitment before. He, we've been trying to get him to come to church, but, but finally he did, and, and today, the pastor's taking him back and wants to baptize him. And I said, Dad, what, what made you decide to be baptized today? And his father said, didn't you hear what the pastor had to say? He said, Jesus gave his life so that we could be saved. He said, I, I, I hung my head in shame. I, I confess that that beautiful message of the Bible didn't reach me because I was having a marvelous time watching the cricket. He says, you know, to this day, I, I kind of believe the cricket was talking just to me. He was saying, watch me. Jesus isn't so important. I'm a lot more fun. That day, he, he was. He said, you know, since that time, a lot of crickets have, uh, have crossed my path and uh, distracted me from hearing Christ's message. And I think that can be true of all of us if we, if we aren't careful. The life is, is really just one big distraction after another, isn't it? It's our work and our family, our, our financial situation, it's life's pleasures, it's life's responsibilities. You know, it's not so much that we don't want to follow Christ, but we're so, so darn busy. So much to do. So much we want to experience. So the message is we, we have to watch out for the crickets. We have to watch out for those things that would distract us from, from Christ's message. So let's get back to verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Some just weren't suited to, uh, to follow the Christian life, and uh, I suspect others simply got distracted by, uh, by crickets. But for a lot of us, those people who really committed to follow Christ, we can't imagine doing anything else. Because we find in Jesus everything we'll ever need. We found healing and hope and happiness, places, things we couldn't find any place else. But when the crowd had gone away, Jesus was left with the original 12 who had followed him since the very early days. He turned to one of them and said, you don't want to leave me too, do you? That's kind of a, a logical question. The easy days of that ministry of, of God. The remarkable days of his enormous popularity and wondrous miracles of, where people hung on every single word, those days were, were, were coming to an end. His disciples knew it. Jesus, I think, wanted to give him a way out, and so he said, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And of course, who steps up but Peter? We've read these words for about two or three Sundays in a row. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One. What a phenomenal statement of faith. But there's no wonder that, that Jesus loved Peter. And we knew that Peter wasn't perfect. Far from it. There was time that he was not was coming that Jesus knew in the near future that he was going to let Jesus down. And that's true of, of every single one of us. No matter how intent we are in following Jesus, it's really tough to keep the crickets at bay. We're not Christ. Peter wasn't Christ. But that doesn't mean that we can't do all that we can to, to give our hearts to Christ. He is the words, he is the one who has the words for eternal life, as, as Peter said. Martin Coburn, Martin Copenhaver is a UCC pastor. This is how he closed his last sermon to, a, to his congregation. I want to tell you what Jesus means to me, he said. I want to share my belief that everything depends upon him. I want to urge you to learn from him. I want to assure you that you can lean on him in hard times. You can entrust your life to him. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is God with us all whether we're together or apart. That's what it's all about. That's all I know, he said. I think all of us want to be able to echo those words. I want us to know that, that this is what Jesus means to each and every one of us as well. Everything depends upon him. We must learn from him. We must be assured that we can lean on him in all circumstances of life, that we can entrust our lives to him. Because he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That's what it's all about. Jesus turned to the original twelve and said, You do not want to leave me too, do you? And Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Please stand. Would you join me in making an affirmation of faith? I believe in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the source of all light and life. I believe that God sent Jesus Christ as the Word incarnate into this world so that all might be bathed in His light and know the true source of life. With the witness of the disciples, I believe that Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried, and broke back to life that we might have new life in him. I believe the word of God still speaks today to those who have ears and hearts to listen. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that my life can be a witness to God's living presence and grace. Amen. May we affirm our faith by singing what a friend we have in Jesus in number 506.
we bring you for our prayer before our Heavenly Father this week. Let's pay special attention to uh, the new baby girl, Parker Lee. For all those kids going back to school and to college. And prayers for Tara, and Mark, and Jackie. So her baby Steve. Be with Bishop Bernie as she mourns the death of her mother, who was 102 years old. We pray for Joey and Bill and uh, Mary. God, we give you thanks that you revealed yourself in the words of Scripture, read and proclaimed among us. We are grateful that you also make yourself known in bread and the fruit of the vine. We thank you for all the people who support and challenge us to be better disciples. Our greatest joy is to experience your presence and respond to you, and we do this humbly today. We continue our prayer by praying our Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our operatory prayer. Gracious God, Jesus promises his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift that remains as powerful and transformative today as it was on the first Pentecost. With generous and thankful hearts, we offer our gifts to you, our time, treasure, and talent, but most of all, our hearts. Use us as these offerings for your purposes and glory. Amen.
and grace upon grace be yours, and may the glory of God's only Son be known to you now and forever. Amen.